Our Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures. Thank you for your Holy Scriptures. And we ask now, with your Scriptures open before us, by the power of your Spirit, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the mission of City Church is to make disciples to make disciples from all nations. And we like to say that this is our mission because this is exactly what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Because we are disciples of Jesus, Jesus is our highest allegiance, and we want to do whatever he says. And he says to make disciples, which means we want to multiply and mature worshipers, servants, and missionaries of Jesus who live faithfully in the home, the church, and the world. And as we do this, as we seek to fulfill this mission, it leads us to planting new churches who do the same. This is our vision. Our vision is what it looks like if our mission is effective. It's the tangible outcome of our compounded discipleship efforts. And I love talking about this. I love drawing this out. I, um, I, I love getting into the details of how this works. But the most important question here when it comes to our vision is why? Like why do we want to plant churches? And now ultimately the answer to that question is for the glory of God. We, we believe that saturating a metro with healthy local churches will lead to the maximum display of God's glory in that metro. We believe that. And there's also, though, a, another answer to this question of why, and it's actually more fundamental. We believe that church planting is deeply biblical. And the reason that I start with all this this morning is because our passage today, Titus 1 verses 5 to 16, gives us the clearest, most practical rationale for church planting in the entire New Testament. And I I, want to show you this, okay? So the plan is to work through all the verses in the passage, but my goal is to, to really paint for you a picture of what Paul is doing here in in three layers. There are three layers of reality to what Paul is saying here in this passage. So imagine, if you will, for a minute, imagine a a picture, imagine a painting, okay? And in a painting, there are at least three layers, three, three things that are going on. There's first the background, okay? There's the background of the painting. Then there's the subject or the the central action of the painting. And then there's what's surrounding the action. There's like the air of the painting, okay? And all three of these levels of reality are found in this passage. There's the background, there's the, the center action or subject, and then there's, there's the air. And I wanna show you these things, okay? So we're gonna be walking through, looking at this painting, starting here with this first thing. What's the background, okay? Here's the painting, what's the background here in the passage? Well, the background in the passage is the purpose of elders. Okay, this is something that we've seen elsewhere in the New Testament. Okay, this is something we saw um, back in 1 Timothy and we talked about back in our 1 Timothy series. The purpose of elders we, we've seen is to defend the church's doctrinal purity. That's the primary purpose. Now back in our series through 1 Timothy, we, we talked about how uh, eldership basically is, is primarily a teaching office. Elders or pastors are primarily in a teaching office to serve the local church. Pastors open the Bible and instruct the church on what God has to say, which includes protecting the church from false teaching. This was Paul's way of thinking in 1 and 2 Timothy, which we saw, and it's still God's way of thinking here in the the letter to Titus. The main verb in the passage is there in verse 5. It's that Paul left Titus in Crete. That's what he says there in verse 5. And this is important because what he's doing here is the foundation to everything else he says. Titus was in Crete on purpose. And the purpose, Paul says, was to put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I, as I directed you. And we're going to come back to this because this is the, the action. But, but first, I want you to notice here that, that after Paul says this, he, he doesn't spend another sentence before he describes what is required of elders. 
He gets straight into the qualifications for elders. First, an elder must be a man of character, verse 6, which doesn't mean that he can put on a character show, but he must be a man of character among those who know him best, his family. And this matters because, verse 7, an elder is an overseer, which Paul says is like being God's steward. And I love this, this description of a pastor the word here for steward means to be like a household manager. Think of like a, like a, like a housekeeper, or we might say a custodian. The, the, the idea of custodian and steward is, is the, same, the same thing. And what's important about this word is first what it does not mean. A steward is not an owner. A steward is only entrusted with the task of managing what is owned by someone else. And in the case of pastors, the church over which we see is owned by Jesus. In fact, Jesus doesn't just own the church, but he created the church by his blood. And this is something that pastors always have to keep in mind throughout their work. I've told you before, this is a couple years ago, you, you might remember, I told you that the pastors at City's Church, we like to think of ourselves as janitors. We are. Every Thursday, every other Thursday, we meet together as a, as a team of happy janitors, which means we understand we do not create anything. We take our orders from Jesus as he has spoken to us according to the scriptures. And according to scripture, the primary duty of janitors, of pastors, is to guard the church's sound doctrine by teaching sound doctrine, which which is positive, and by defending against false doctrine, which is negative. These are two sides of the same coin. We see this in verse 9. This is the only duty of pastors mentioned in this passage. Everything else here that's said in verses 5 to 8 is about, a, is, is about what a pastor must be. He must be a man of integrity and character. But all of that crescendos at what he must do, verse 9. He must hold firm the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, a tr- the trustworthy word or faithful word mentioned here in the passage in verse 9 is referring to the gospel as Paul has taught it. This means more than the bare minimum of Christian orthodoxy, but Paul's talking about the gospel and everything to do with the gospel that he has written about in the pastoral epistles. We saw this back in 2 Timothy 2. The trustworthy word as taught is the whole pattern of sound doctrine that has been entrusted to Paul and taught by Paul in his apostolic authority, right? Pastors stick with Paul, remember? Pastors stick with Paul. That is the duty of pastors so that Because we embrace this trustworthy apostolic message, we can instruct the church in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. Pastors are meant to hold the doctrinal line. The Bible's clear on this. The New Testament is super clear on this, and it's good to know, all right? And it's also, I think, good to point out, to note that The modern concept of pastors is much different than this biblical vision. In our consumeristic society, the market demand for most pastors is not truth-telling, but helpfulness. And that is helpfulness as determined by the individual's sense of fulfillment. Do you feel helped? Does that feel good? As a society at large, we are addicted to entertainment and to immediate gratification. And as Americans, we tend to expect this everywhere, even in the church, even from pastors. But the main purpose of pastors, according to the Bible, according to what Paul is saying here, the main purpose of pastors is to defend the church's right doctrine. 
That this is the background to what Paul is saying. That this is the conviction. This is the way of thinking that Paul brings here to this letter to Titus. It's where he's coming from, okay? So just imagine the painting. This is the background, okay? This is what's behind what we're here about to see in the action, okay? Background. Now, second thing here. What's the action of the passage? Well, the action in the passage is Titus planting churches. Verse 5 again, Paul says, uh, he left Titus in Crete on purpose. The purpose is stated as the action here in verse 5. First, that you might put what remained in order. And second, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. These are not two different things, but the second part explains the first. Putting what remained into order is achieved by appointing elders in every town. Now, what exactly does that mean? What all hinges, it hinges here on the meaning of what remained. Paul is saying that there are some things left undone in Crete, and that is because apparently Paul had been to Crete for at least a short while. We see this in the book of Acts, chapter 28. When Paul was on his way to Rome, they stopped in Crete. And it helps, I think, for us to, to get an idea of what is Crete, where is Crete, okay? So again, as you're imagining this, Crete is a Greek island which is directly south of Athens. It's right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So right, if you were to leave this afternoon, right now, like today, if you were to leave this afternoon, you could be in Crete by this time tomorrow. It's a 19-hour and four-minute flight from MSP to Amsterdam, to Athens, to Crete. You're there, okay? Crete is, is still a bustling place today. I hear that to to Ziki is amazing. Um, and so you can go there. You could, you could be there by this time tomorrow if you wanted to. Now, Crete in the ancient world was not much different than it is today. It was known in the ancient world to be a place of several cities. It was divided up in different cities all throughout. And that's what Paul is talking about here when he says to, to go throughout these different towns and to, to appoint elders. Now, the word here for town in the Greek is the word polis. And we, of course, know the word polis is where we get, is, is we translate that word also city. But the reason, if you have an English standard version, the reason that the English Standard Version says town, it's because we tend to think of cities as like really big urban areas, right? But, but the, the cities here in Crete were probably more similar to what we think about when we think of towns, okay? They, there were not huge, you know, skyscrapers and buildings. They were smaller, but they were, there, there were pockets of people who lived there. And so basically what happened is that Paul, it lands in, he lands in Crete and he travels through these towns. He preaches the gospel in these towns. People believe the gospel. The Cretans turn from their sin. They turn from their idols. They put their faith in Jesus, but then Paul had to leave. He had to go before he completed his ministry. And so now Titus is left there, sent there to finish that work, to put what remained into order. He's saying, hey, Titus, organize these Christians there by appointing elders in every town, which means Paul is telling Titus to plant churches. Cretans all throughout these towns have believed the gospel, but they were not yet organized into local churches under the stewardship of elders. That's what Titus has to do. He has to organize these Christians into communities of faith under the leadership of qualified men appointed as pastors. That's the action here in the passage. The primary duty of these pastors that Titus appoints is to guard the church's right doctrine. That's what pastors do. And this is all relevant, especially relevant here, because in verse 10 we see there is a lot of false doctrine going around. Verse 10 is, is really important here. It's the key, it's the, it's the key ground to what Paul is saying. The job of Titus to plant these churches was immediately occasioned by this situation here in verse 10. Verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers especially of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. You see, the, the, this is what's going on. There are false teachers all throughout these towns of Crete and they must be silenced. 
but how can they be silenced if there are no pastors to silence them? And how can there be pastors unless they are appointed? And how can pastors be appointed unless there are local congregations planted for them to steward? That was the job of Titus. Organize these Christians into churches overseen by pastors who teach good doctrine and rebuke bad doctrine because bad doctrine is everywhere and it must be stopped. There are many good, great reasons to plant churches. It does glorify God, and that's most important. Church planting is also the best evangelism strategy out there. It's also biblical. We, we see Paul do it and give instructions about it. And th there are all kinds of other benefits to planting churches. But if we focus on this passage... If we take into account what Paul is saying here, the clearest biblical reason to plant churches is for the sake of gospel purity. See, this world is polluted with lies about God. It wasn't just a one-time thing in Crete, but this is part of redemptive history. This is the, the age we live in until Jesus comes back. The Apostle John says that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world through false teaching, through lies about God. And so just to, just to bring this down a little for us, this means that Minneapolis and St. Paul, our cities, are polluted with lies about God. Everywhere you turn, there is rebellion against God and his moral will. There are empty talkers and deceivers and whole identities of people who are bound together by their shared rejection of the gospel and they are active. They have a vision for your life and for your children and how you should think and how you should live and, and what you should chase and they're going to let you know. They're going to tell you. And this might seem to us like it's not a big deal. It may not feel to us like a threat, but if we could see things from Paul's perspective, we would understand that we live in a, war, a world at war and the war is for our hearts, your hearts. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. And when you are surrounded by lies about God all day long, who is going to tell you the truth? Can we get a truth-telling outpost here in these cities? Can we start more? How many can we start? Can we saturate these twin cities with truth-telling outposts in every town? Embassies of the kingdom of Christ who refuse to buy what the world is selling but instead give away the greatest news there ever was that Jesus Christ saves sinners and his way is better than our way. That it doesn't matter where you're from or, or where you've been or how broken you are. It doesn't matter because Jesus took the penalty for our sin. Jesus took all of our sin and our guilt and our shame. And by his death on the cross, he absorbed the punishment that we deserve. And, and he conquered. He defeated death itself because on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the Father's right hand. And he did it to save a people in right Right now, Jesus on his throne has sent his spirit and his gospel so that when you hear this news, when you hear this message, if you, empowered by the Holy Spirit, turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, you will be saved. You will be forgiven. You will become a son or daughter of God with a new purpose for today and hope for tomorrow. So bow to Jesus. That's what we say. Bow to Jesus and enter into a life of fellowship with God and discipleship in his truth. Cities Church, this is our message. This is what we say to these cities. We are a truth-telling outpost. 
And we want to start more truth-telling outposts to raid against the deception that surrounds us. This is why we plant churches. This is why. And this brings us back to our painting here, the painting. You see in the background. The background, it, the background is the purpose of pastors. Pastors are meant to guard the church's right doctrine. Now the action is that Titus is planting churches. He, he's organizing churches, appointing pastors over them specifically to stand against false teaching. Okay, so which means he didn't just plant churches, but he planted churches to silence the bad doctrine to stop the deception. Church planting is for the sake of gospel purity. But now why, okay? Why exactly are churches so necessary to guard good doctrine? This is the air of the passage, okay? This is what's surrounding the action here, and it's more of an implication, but I, I don't think we can read a single verse without, without breathing this in, okay? This is the third thing here, the air. What's the air of the passage? Well, the air of the passage is that the local church is essential for Christian endurance. Again, this is not stated explicitly, but it's there. Okay, imagine if Titus had not planted these churches. What's at stake? If Titus had not fulfilled this task, it would have meant that all these new Christians in Crete would not have been part of local churches. And the fact is, Christians who are not part of the local church typically don't stay Christian. Individual Christians outside the local church are extremely vulnerable to falling away. And there are at least two reasons in the passage that show us this, but the first thing to say is that this, this, is, just, this is just part of uh, the very nature of salvation here, okay? This is just essential to the very fact of being a Christian. We are never saved just from sin, but we are saved from sin to God and to his people. Paul is going to tell Titus in chapter 2, verse 13, that Jesus gave himself to save a people for his own possession. Not a person there and there and there and there who are only voluntarily connected, but it's a people. It's a people from every tribe and tongue and nation who presently covenant together in local assemblies. The local church is the authority on earth that Jesus has instituted to officially affirm and give shape to the Christian life. There's, just, there's really no such thing as a Christian who is not part of a body of Christians. The local church is central to our being, our being in Christ. And in this passage, that, that's, just, that's just the nature of salvation. In the passage, though, we see, we see two things specifically where this comes through, especially relevant here. The first is we, we need the church. The reason the church is essential for Christian endurance is, one, we need the church to challenge our cultural values. This is verse 12. Titus is planting churches in Crete, among Cretans. And Cretans, you see here, they have a terrible reputation. Look at verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now in the passage, Paul is quoting this saying because he's given an extended explanation of these false teachers, okay? It means f false teaching, period. False teachers, period, are a problem. But what's especially troubling about Crete is that apparently there were cultural values that exacerbated the problem of false teaching. Here are insubordinate, empty talking, deceptive false teachers teaching for shameful gain what they should not teach. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And then pile on top of that. That's a problem already. Now pile on top of that a value system with a reputation of deceit, evil, and selfish consumption. Not only are these false teachers wrong, but they have a whole society around them that reinforces their wrongness. And this whole thing, what it does is it, it seeks to smother Christians. 
And the way that it seeks to smother Christians is by providing hopeless answers for gospel-induced questions. Let me explain how, how this goes. One of the realities of global missions is that as the gospel advances throughout the world and in different societies, it, it reveals what's been called the crisis of humanity. It means at the very least, when the gospel advances, at the very least, the gospel teaches us and, and confirms for us that something in your life is missing because we were made by God, but we have rebelled against God. And, and this is a crisis that every human everywhere shares. We all share this crisis of humanity. But now the gospel doesn't just point out the crisis, but there's also an answer. Jesus is the Savior. The gospel comes, exposes the crisis, but says Jesus is the one who came to save us and to restore our relationship to God. But what happens if you reject Jesus as the Savior? Well, if you reject Jesus as the Savior, you're still stuck with the crisis. Which means you have to figure out other saviors. And so now Q, you have to find other saviors. Now Q, the value systems of a sinful society. Societies who are aware of the crisis of humanity, who have been influenced by the gospel. Societies who are aware of the crisis of humanity, even subconsciously, will produce false hopes, alternative hopes, to answer the crisis. And those false hopes can seek to smother Christians because they are everywhere around us. They become the way of thinking, the default way of thinking as a society. And what happens is we form as a society these unquestioned assumptions and they're fixed all around us everywhere we go. And they stay there until the gospel challenges these unquestioned assumptions through the local church. The local church is meant to be that countercultural band of human citizens who understand that our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. So we, we identify these Christians, this band of countercultural believers, human citizens, we identify ourselves as first Christians, not Cretans. And therefore, because that is our first identity, we're able to challenge the hopeless answers of our surrounding world. The church is meant to be a distinct society within society who operates under the lordship of Jesus. This is why we need the church. Jesus has given this challenge authority to the church in order to keep Christians from being swept away by sinful value systems that surround us. This, this is how Christians endure. Second thing here, the second reason in the passage for how Christians endure because of the local church is two, we need the church for hope beyond ourselves. This is the last thing to say. See this in verse 13. This is honestly to me the most amazing thing in the passage. Look what Paul says here. He's talking about these Cretan false teachers. Verse 13, therefore, Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now this command to rebuke is consistent with they must be silenced in verse 11. And also the duty of pastors in verse 9. This is right in line with what Paul's been saying. But what's astonishing here is that the purpose of this rebuke is that these false teachers might be sound in the faith. Paul does not say rebuke them to crush them. He does not say kick them out and be done. He, he could say that. He does say that. He said that about Alexander the coppersmith in 1st and 2nd Timothy. Paul could say that. But here, in this case, to Titus, when it comes to these Cretans, he says rebuke them because there's still hope that they might stop and turn. 
God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, Titus. The word hope is not here in this passage. But that's what this is. And hope, as we've talked about last Sunday, again this Sunday, hope is the cardinal distinctive of the local church. And it's not just hope for the future, but it's hope for one another right now. The local church is a community of believers who, who walks to the beat of a different drum than the one we hear by ourselves. We operate on the basis of what God has said, not what our society says, and not what we even might say to ourselves. The hope that we need, I want you to know, the hope that we need is not generated here, okay? The hope that we need comes from outside of us. And the church, filled by the Holy Spirit, is the people who are tapped into that hope so that when you can't see it yourself, your brothers and sisters can say to you, hey, hey, hope. There's hope. There's hope, church. This is what we need for endurance. And this also obliges me as a pastor to make a commitment to you. There was, as we've seen, a lot stacked against the Cretans. Okay, a lot. And yet, look at Paul. He, the, way he, the way he engages the Cretans, he knew what God was able to do. And therefore, he was able to minister with hope. And so, with God's help, our pastors want to serve you the same way. Which means, I promise you, with God's help, church, I will never give up on you. Never. We, we need that from each other. We need to be this kind of people together. And if we can be this kind of church, and if we can plant these kind of churches, we will conquer the world with the hope of the gospel. Starting with these twin cities. And that's what brings us now to the table. Each week, we come to this table to remember that the victory has been won. Jesus has won the victory in his death and resurrection. In his death and resurrection, Jesus accomplished our salvation and he secured our future together with him. And so as we come, we come here together. Together we give Jesus thanks. Each week we share this meal as the covenant members of our church. But if you're here this morning and you trust in Jesus, we invite you to eat and to drink with us. As we come, the pastors will serve you. You can just put your hand out like this and we will drop the elements in your hand. The body of Jesus is the true bread. The blood of Jesus is the true drink. Let us serve you.